is, this is the first day we've just started. And uh, we've come here from, let's see, what we done? We were in, uh, in uh, Dallas for QuakeCon, and uh, we went out to Seattle for PAX, and we went over to Gamescom for Cologne. But this is the Eurogamer event in London, which is where I'm from. It's where our studio Splash Damage is based. So it's the first time I've had a chance to kind of show, you know, our native country uh, the game and let them come along and play it. Uh, we opened this morning at about 9.30 and the queues are already at sort of two, three hours. So it's a bit a bit frustrating, I imagine, for people that really want to play the game. And, you know, we're doing our best to get people through as quickly as possible, but um, it is looking really, really good. Um, Spring looks amazing. Um, with the upper class and the lower class in the art and sort of a thing going on. What's sort of happening with the middle class? Well, basically, what happened is in the in the kind of fiction of the games world, um, around now this uh, uh, you know new facility called the Ark is built just off of the coast of San Francisco, and it's built really with a kind of green and sustainable vision of what floating cities could mean for the kind of future of habitation and academia and commercial research and everything else. But it goes through a kind of you know really difficult period, starting out you know funded by billionaire philanthropists, but running short of money and now needing to kind of repurpose itself. So they have this huge founders tower in the centre area where the founders live, and you know they go through that same thing you'd expect, trying to sell apartments, trying to set up a uh, thing as a kind of holiday destination with celebrities flying in and out and having photo opportunities at this 10 star hotel. But they realise that if they turn it out into the middle of the Pacific, then they can start to get work from uh, huge corporations that want to conduct research in international waters, which of course is a, a very profitable pursuit for them. So it's turned into the middle of the Pacific, but what started as a microcosm now has to be started, and now starts to be built out. So you have the addition of things like solar farms, wind farms, algae processing units, food and so on. <laughs> but around 2025, they suddenly lose contact with the rest of the Earth. There's no passing ships, no overhead flights, complete radio silence, and then refugees start to arrive in their thousands from nearby atolls that have been flooded. So the suspicion is that the rest of the Earth is underwater, that the rise of, rising Earth's oceans have happened very suddenly and taken everybody out, but there's no absolute or guaranteed confirmation of this. But this facility that was originally built to house 5,000 now has to house 50,000. So the uh, logistics uh, areas like um, uh, like the dockyard where um, it later becomes container city starts out really just as this kind of fully roboticized facility where the original founders can store you know their central valuable belongings but when it's repurposed for habitation over the subsequent 20 years it really just kind of descends into squat these people live in, in horrific conditions where there are very limited resources both you know food and water no power and uh, certainly no kind of sewage drain refuse collection and stuff. So they start to get quite frustrated because it seems to them that you have this mass of resources on the upper R, uh, you know, which for fictional terms you could call the norm, but that's largely irrelevant in the absence of uh, uh, and uh, in the upper arc you have the original founders who have limited resources but are doing a pretty good job of managing them. So they have the appearance of still continuing to live their luxurious lifestyles, you know, visiting marinas and visiting the shopping centres and stuff like that, where things to the south are just going really bad. So a resistance starts up and this resistance group really represent the refugees and they're just fighting for a, a fairer distribution of resources on behalf of the refugees and they don't see themselves as bad guys. But they're fighting against the security who represent the original founders. Now these security from the original founders don't see themselves as bad guys either. They're really just trying to manage resources. They believe they're maintaining law and order. But the greatest irony in this is that quite often the people fighting against security are the sons and daughters of refugees that are commuting to the north to take up these positions and these roles. So the middle class is almost kind of broken away because they were the you know white lab coat wearing research scientists and things who have become the kind of upper arc when the refugees came in. Um, what sort of technical difficulties did your experience face? I suppose the toughest thing for us as a developer 
is that up until the end of 2007, yeah, we were really a, I guess what the industry would call a hardcore multiplayer shooter studio that developed exclusively for the PC. And what we've developed at Brink is a game that is, you know, multi-platform, it's for the Xbox 360, the PlayStation 3 and the PC, um, all launching simultaneously with the goal of achieving absolute visual and gameplay parity on all three platforms. So there's never this sense that, you know, if you buy the PS3, it's a port of the Xbox 360 or a port of the PC or whatever else. So maintaining those three platforms in development is a particular challenge, I think, for developers. And then, of course, just the fact that we've introduced, you know, a number of quite significant new features for shooters, like the smart movement system, um, the uh, ability to seamlessly transition between single-player cooperative and multiplayer play, and for all of this to take place in an environment that people have never seen before. So it is a whole fiction that has been built, you know, from somebody staring at a blank piece of paper on day one, in fact, lead writer working this stuff out. So I, I would say probably as a developer, the biggest typical challenge is multi-platform gameplay visual parity, and then, you know, from a design standpoint, it's really just building this world that people have never seen before. Okay. Um, in terms of story, I'm not sure it's just me, but I think it is something that could happen in real life. Would you agree with that? Well, there are certainly examples of, of sea schedules and floating cities and, and people trying to establish uh, places that they can live which exist in international waters outside of the law of existing nations. So that's happening today, that's absolutely a reality. And then I think if you were to ask Richard Hamm, our creative director, he would say it is simply the natural order of things. It is inevitable, 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 uh, uh, that humans will eventually find a reason well, you know, back in the early 80s, I was really into gaming on the, on the Spectrum and the Commodore 64, and I loved that. And then I went through a long period of being an IT guy, and I just became completely obsessed in the late uh, 90s, playing Quake Online, so I played a lot of Quake Team Fortress in a clan as the clan leader, winning tournaments back in 98 and 99. So that was really where my passion came from, playing in a clan <coughs> and realising that that buzz, that satisfaction you get from coordinated team play was just, you know, for me personally, not something that could be bettered by any other gaming experience. When we launched Splash Damage, it was off the back of our work as mod makers creating a mod called Quake 3 Fortress for Quake 3 Arena back in, gosh, 2000, 2001. And so our first game, Wolfenstein Enemy Territory, was a, a pure multiplayer focused game. But my tastes have kind of evolved along with everybody else's over the course of the past decade. And I find myself more often than not sat on my sofa at home playing, you know, Uncharted 2, Mass Effect 2, you know, uh, Fallout and games like that. So I still absolutely love the kind of hardcore multiplayer shooter environment, but I think we're more inspired to include more of a story in our games now and to have more of a narrative direction for the game, where before we were quite happy to just run around and capture flags and deathmatch. You know, we feel now that we want to have a reason why we're fighting, we want to have a series of objectives that we're trying to get completed and then when we coordinate together as a team we're doing so with a bunch of people playing different combat roles someone's playing as a medic, a soldier, an operative, an engineer and playing those roles really effectively and what we're finding with these shows like the one here at Eurogamer is that you know people that have never played the game before we're showing them a short training video four or five minutes because we're dropping them at level two or three so it's as if they've played for a couple of hours they've watched this short training video and uh, sit down and they're coordinating with a whole bunch of strangers to get really quite complex objectives completed and make progress through the game. It's just a really great thing to see. Um, what about how to do it? What about the cause of expansions or any other game? Uh, I mean, of course, we're always thinking about what we're going to be doing next, but generally speaking, our work is focused exclusively in full production on the game at the moment that people are working on. So right now we're around the internally, uh, internally uh, for, uh, for the reach, and then, uh, you know, once we start nearing the release of the Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.